Hi, everybody. So today what we're going to be talking about is the subject of therapy, psychology, and these type of disciplines, and how do these relate to the Catholic faith. So this is a very important video because today there are many different um, issues that face society. There are many people who are suffering in all kinds of different ways. There are problems that we all have that, that really um, need to be resolved and need to be addressed. And how is it that we are going to address these things? We are often encouraged to engage with the disciplines of therapy, psychology, psychiatry, psychology, counseling, and social work. These type of fields provide support to people. And it's very important that practitioners and clients of these fields have an understanding of how to use these disciplines in a way that is in harmony with their faith and does not violate the authentic understanding of the human person. It's most important at the outset of this video to realize that the entire point of making a video about the use of the mental health disciplines for Catholics is not simply to say, okay, how can people of a certain religious group engage with a otherwise perfectly fine discipline? It's instead a way of talking about how can a, can a tradition which holds an authentic understanding of the human person be brought to bear on a tradition of helping that may have some certain kinds of wisdom and expertise, but has in often incomplete understandings of the human person. And so there is something that Catholicism can learn from therapy, but there's a lot that, that therapy can learn from Catholicism. And the thing is that without the understanding of the human person from the Catholic faith, therapy cannot become all that it can be. This is the paradox, that uh, the church contains the true blueprint and almost, you know, for this uh, kind of addition to our uh, our life, um, and the psychological disciplines contain materials that have not yet been organized according to this blueprint, or have been organized according to a different blueprint. So we have to take those materials, those natural materials, and reorganize the concepts, practices, principles of these disciplines so that they actually correspond to the nature of the human person. And so it is an assumption of this video and this approach and this understanding that it is not merely, Catholicism is not merely the religion of a group of people, but is the nature of the universe, which is the, nat is the nature of the created order. It's the nature of the human person. It's, it's the understanding of truth. And so, of course, you must bring truth to bear on all incomplete truth and redeem those things that expand our understandings through this. And just in case this seems like a strange thought of doing this, this is the pattern itself of the Incarnation. It's also the pattern of Scripture. One thing I learned recently was that there is evidence that the Ark of the Covenant even resembles um, the structure of objects that would be carried in Egyptian worship, which lends credence to the fact that the Israelites were in fact in Egypt, and that the plan of the Ark of the Covenant speaks differently about the nature of God, it doesn't have an idol on top, it has these cherubim on top that are just kind of, you know, not, not necessarily not being worshipped, so it's a different... Um, a different setup of a cultural form that already existed. Just like if we see the church itself taking on the cultural form of the Roman Empire, becoming the Roman Catholic Church. We see this is the means of conquest of the church. Also, we see in the Old Testament, the Israelites, they enter the promised land. They take lands and cities that they did not build. They take things 
and they elevate them. This is the motion of the Incarnation. We look at the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. We see her clothed in the image of Aztec culture. And he's saying something different with the symbolism that would be familiar to the native peoples. So we see this pattern of the redemption of cultural forms throughout the New and the Old Testament. And this is the pattern of the incarnation itself, that Christ is the divinity taking on humanity and elevating it. And so this pattern of redeeming the psychological sciences, the therapy approaches, is the pattern itself of Christianity, which is like a chemical reaction introduced into all human thought to organize and bond it all together into a coherent and healing whole so that we can become like other incarnations of the word. Because we are meant to fully express our humanity, our genuine anthropology, and we are meant to use these ideologies so that we can become all one body. And so that these broken philosophies can be redeemed through Christ and our broken humanity can be restored through them so that we can become fully other incarnations of the word and human unity can be authentically found in Christ. And that we will have this uh, exchange of culture and truth and everything will be elevated. So that is the backdrop to this approach and understanding. And we need to say that there are two different distinct, there are, this, is a, this is a redemptive approach. This is not what might be called a biblical counseling approach. Biblical counseling approach might be the idea of saying, okay, throw out all the secular theories. The integrative approach, it would say, okay, the Bible, we need to mix the Bible with, um, secular theories. That's not my approach either. My approach is that, or, or the way I understand this, is that all secular theories are wrong. No one may, no one, that I do not believe it is okay for a Catholic to, to use or teach or espouse or counsel or therapize people with establish, any established theory. They are all in themselves incorrect about what the human person is. So not only are they not healthy, they are heretical, essentially. So they are not true and they are not good in themselves, although there, there are elements that are redeemable within them, some of which are reflections of, are, are very powerful reflections of true principles and therefore um, can be very... Um, helpful. And so they can be very powerfully redeemed and can show us things that we might not otherwise think. So what is it about these approaches? Why would we need these things? What would it do? Well, or, or why would there be some type of goodness in them? Well, I think it's the same type of principle we could think about if somebody were to be blind. And if somebody was to be was to go blind, they would develop their sense other senses very well. Like my uncle uh, Charlie, pray for his soul. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Um, and he was blind, and he got really good at maybe hearing things, and you know um, these type of things like that. He got really good at at um, you know these other senses. And in the same way, the secular theories can explore territory very in-depth with like as if other senses are being used. And because they really use, they really explore a certain aspect of the human condition without the light of grace, they grope around in the dark and find different things and they knock into things and maybe explore more thoroughly than somebody in the light of grace might. So they can discover some territory, but they're just. But we need to bring the light into what they've discovered, so that we can really see what they found and reorganize a few things. Because they may, they really were trapped somewhere trying to discover the inside of this cave, you know. But they don't exactly see what they found, and so we need to bring the light of truth in there, so we really can get a deeper understanding of that territory, um, and then it's usable. And it's usable because, in a way, just like the person. It's as if what will happen is that when we apply these heightened senses that were developed under this thing of being blind, so to speak, but we take them and we integrate them into a sighted person, we become even more what we were meant to be originally. We become, our human nature becomes more like the human nature of Christ, which is perfect. 
and we, we and we, and when it's and when we use these theories in light of grace, we can use them in a way that helps elevate ourselves so that we can really understand how to live and our human nature can be healed and elevated and we can better bear the light of grace with a stronger human nature. Our human nature, we can become more like Christ's human nature and then the divinity of Christ can better be born inside of us. And so these things are very deeply important to our healing and the healing and the reconciliation of all ideologies and the reconciliation of parts of ourselves. Now, it's very important to remember too that there are things that are deeply wrong with us. And I think it's good at the outset of this video, which explains how somebody should engage with the mental health disciplines to simply state uh, some things about how the mind is and with some of the problems there are. Essentially, all the approaches of the world to therapy, philosophy, and religion, which are essentially the same thing, if we really think about it, they all are about how do we manage our lower passions with our higher capacities. They're all different approaches to what we might call brain control or self-regulation. These are all different types of approaches that use different types of things. I actually don't think that there's any categorical difference between the ideas of therapy, philosophy, and religion. Because I think that in, in essence, what we might say practically about therapy is that the only reason why therapy is separated from religion is because religion is not understood well in society. Religion and th so theology and philosophy are meant to organize the content of all the lower sciences, but that's not how things are done in a society that is not actively Catholic. But this is just an accident of history. That, that, that would be the actual um, real way things should be. So it's not that there should be some discipline separate from religion that is therapy, because religion is the truth. And the thing is that things are just in rebellion against truth, not that there should really be something outside of truth. So to, so to say that there should be this kind of secular therapy, I mean, of course, we need to meet people where they are. We can't shove religion down everybody's throats when they're not ready for it. But the thing, the fact that there's any separation is merely an artificial thing, in some ways is artificial. There, I mean, of course, there could be some practical separations between, you know, researchers and, you know, the church. You know, there needs to be some practical separation, but the, the actual complete separation is, is merely an accident of history. The other thing to be said is that it's very hard if somebody actually were to try to think, what's the difference between a therapy, a philosophy, and a religion? I really don't think there really is any real difference between what they are in their essence. And this is something that the philosopher Alistair McIntyre spoke about, where he talked about that there's these differences, the ways we can categorize things can sometimes merely be encyclopedic. Like we could say, okay, well, um, so these things go under the encyclopedia entry called philosophy. And these things go under the encyclopedia entry called religion. A classic example of this is the philosophy of Stoicism. The philosophy of Stoicism is one of the most interesting religions that, that exists. And there's no real reason why it's put into philosophy rather than religion, other than that we're having a poor way of organizing knowledge under categories rather than the essence of what a thing is. A religion, a philosophy, or therapy are ways of managing our lower tendencies with our higher capacities. That's what they are. They're all really essentially the same kind of thing. Now, somebody might object and say, oh, well, um, Buddhism is just breathing, and that's, or Stoicism and is just thinking rational. Those, that's, that's not religion. Well, the whole thing boils down to they were religions. They are religions, but they are natural religions rather than supernatural ones. So it's like, so they're really, we, they are religions that are relying on a lower faculty as the highest faculty, not they are categorically a different kind of a thing. So these are some, some things that I just want to present. This is, there's a lot of information coming out in this video, 
But I just want to organize these things because we need to understand the relation between these fields. The better way to talk about the relation between philosophy, religion, and therapy is to understand that theology has to organize philosophy, which has to organize lower sciences. That doesn't, and they, these are, this is all under a Catholic understanding. And the thing is that we have to understand that we have to subalternate, as um, as one theorist talked about, we have to subalternate these disciplines to the higher disciplines. And the thing is that, you know, we can say that okay, well, yes, Buddhism is not using necessarily some. Of course, many forms of Buddhism are somewhat ritualistic and have these other spiritual elements. But we could say okay, breathing. It's not, it seems to not be a religion. Well, it is if we understand that to be the highest faculty and the liberation of self comes through awareness. And we, if we understand the use of these things, we understand that these are simply religions that are using a different faculty as its central feature, not a different kind of a thing. And so we also come to this simple understanding, is, is there really a division between therapy and religion? And is it is practiced now? I will make the bold claim that there is no difference between therapy and religion, and the current practice of therapy is the practice of religion and the imposition of religion upon clients unknowingly. Religion is a constant feature of normal therapy. Religion is promoted to clients all the time. As long as these religions are not recognized encyclopedically as religions by Westerners, so therefore, yoga, which is a Hindu discipline of a Hindu religion, is widely used in Western therapy because as a religion of consciousness and body, it is not understood or noticed as religion, meaning belief system that you only think about on one day in traditional Western thinking and modern times. Like, like, oh, I go to this building on this day, I think this thing that doesn't impact my life. That's maybe the caricature of what religion is for Westerners. So discipline with the body and the mind and this is not onto the grid of the Westerner thinking about religion, but is often the, con often the content of therapy. So the Eastern religions are widely, and their philosophical premises are widely used by therapists in mainstream therapy even by therapists who have a somewhat of a bent toward Christianity. This, these things are often promoted. I do not promote yoga. I don't think it's a good thing to do. I do think you can stretch and breathe. I think you could stretch and breathe at the same time, but not in the yoga poses. I think you could stretch, breathe, and pray at the same time. That's great. Not in the yoga poses. That's its own video. Um, but the thing to remember here is that the, the use already of these things constitutes religion. And for example, if we even want to go further, we can understand that the cognitive therapies, which seem to be the mainstream flagship therapies for the last who knows how many years, the evidence-based treatments have, re have had, at least in one of its major schools of thought, so there's CBT and then there's REBT, REBT has had overtly religious statements made. So for example, even messianic statements um, that it would save the world. I mean, you look at these early videos, of Albert Ellis, they talk about how rational thinking can change the world, how it is against this absolutistic, um, they were, use the word Jehovian thinking. Um, they use this, this word of thinking that, uh, uh, Albert Ellis talks about promoting the gospel according to St. Albert, referring to himself, you know, that, that this gospel of rationality, which is going to change the world and lead people out of their narrow religious and moral views. So it's going to liberate us from these. So, it had, so the thing is, there's no escaping the religious, messianic, and these tendencies which are deeply rooted in the human person, that even in trying to free humanity from religion, we must take on this religious impulse. That, so there, there's, this, um, there's a way in which all these things, when they are already done, they already have religious implications. They already have religious implications implications to them. It's, and then if we go further, there are religious implications in the use of the 12 steps in the mainstream recovery industry. To have a higher power and a moral inventory, to make amends for wrongs, and to meditate on 
take time to meditate and pray, these are already spiritual actions. So as we can see, the field of religion and the field of therapy as practiced today are one field. The question is not, are we imposing religion? on clients, or are we practicing religion when we practice therapy? Because religion is to link back and to glue together, to religare, to ligate, to, to link, to glue um, these uh, glue things together. How are we gluing our higher faculties to our lower, the lower tendencies? How are we controlling one with the other? We are practicing ligation, relegare, at least, at least we're doing ligation in some way, uh, or, or, or yeah, we're, we're relinking stuff together, um, whether it's we're linking ourselves together or linking only ourselves or ourselves together with God, um, with God, but not together, you know, it's like there's all different ways we can link this stuff up, but the thing is, you know, the bottom line is I believe that there is no distinction between the fields. And that's something that is a philosophical, that probably should be a strange thought. So these are some philosophical assumptions that underlie the approach that we're going to talk about today and the th or in these videos. And this is kind of the philosophical background. And it's to understand this, that there really is this, um, there is wisdom in all these things. And I believe there is wisdom in all the different religions. But I believe that this wisdom cannot be itself unless it becomes Catholic unless it becomes integrated with a complete anthropology of the human person. So the different things that we might find that might uh, speak about how to use our awareness well or how to use our rationality well, will only find their true home and greatest functionality in a complete understanding of the human person. And the Catholic understanding is one that promotes this. And so what I would say is that the book by Father Irala, Achieving Peace of Heart gives us the Catholic anthropology into which all human thought can be organized. These anthropologies can be found in St. Thomas Aquinas and in the Christian East. Um, and there's different numbers of faculties in these anthropologies. But there is, in general, I think, a simple method that I use that I think kind of derives a little bit from these, but is very simple and corresponds to the existing theories. And this anthropology involves this. It says that, yes, okay, number one, we have the faculty of awareness. Number two, we can imagine. Number three, we can have our intellect that thinks. Number four, we can, we can decide to do things. And number five, we can use our heart to love and to relate. And then deep within us, there is the spirit, the soul, the inmost place where grace dwells. And this corresponds to the entire field of therapy, and the, especially in its modern expressions. The, um, the awareness and the visualization correspond very clearly to the practices of, you know, um, the mindfulness therapies, which are Buddhist. The, um, the, um, uh, an, an imagination can be found, you know, in these visualizations too, in these in these type of disciplines, and it can also be found in the higher disciplines of the cognitive therapies, which are like Stoicism, the, that use the rational faculty, and then we see the the abilities of um, the use of the will and the behavioral techniques, which are in there, which are like doing things like behavioral experiments, getting on a plane if you're scared to do that, the behavioral things. Then we see the heart and the heart corresponding to the disciplines of the 12-step movement, the, the things like that. And then we see the spirit, which corresponds to, to properly the sacraments and the practice of the Catholic faith and its devotions and these type of things and prayer. And so the, this is the uh, the way we can understand how all these things integrate and how we can use these lower things in light of the higher things and redeem it into one way of elevating ourselves to be have a strengthened humanity to better bear the light of divinity, to be um, other incarnations of the word and to share in the Immaculate Conception of Mary, to be like the Immaculate Conception, to progress to resemblance toward the Immaculate Conception and toward the incarnate word. And this is the purpose of therapy, of religion, is to make ourselves, through the redemption of culture, to make ourselves into 
other incarnations of the word and to bring us all together into one human family. And this is the power and beauty of this whole vision. And so the thing that we want to think about here is that this is the whole this is the whole thing here. And the thing that's really going on psychologically, those are our faculties. And what our goal is, is to understand that as Father Irala speaks about, he says he talks about how often our mind is kind of on autopilot. Our mind is often in what he calls the passive state, that we're not disciplined. And that this is really what all our problems come from, that we don't live, we don't, we're not living in this fo focused and disciplined way. And that our mind is kind of out of shape and going wherever it wants. And so we need to begin to use these faculties through these techniques, to use these faculties through, through these different techniques at these different levels, so that we can then begin to manage our lower tendencies, our tendencies to anger and desire and fear and so pride and so on and so forth to use our higher tendencies, those faculties, the, the um, awareness, the imagination, the intellect, the will, the, the heart, the spirit. We want to use all this stuff to manage all these lower tendencies. And of course, we want to bring the, the unconscious, so to speak, this lower level through the conscious into harmony with the superconscious, meaning God. So we want to link all these levels through the use of the faculties. And so this beautiful result is that we become sons and daughters of God, that we share our, we become, again, other incarnations of the word. We use our faculty, strengthening them, but we also enter into relationship. Because what we do, so for example, if I'm upset, I tell God about my anger. So my conscious brings my unconscious into the superconscious, and the superconscious hears me and helps me to be healed. And so um, it's not about suppressing our anger. It's about moderation and integration of all that is which is lower so that we can become in, in union with the higher. So it's like the, it's the moderation and integration of these things. Um, and this is what's so important because the, moder the, the moderation and integration of ourselves happens alongside the moderation and integration of cultures and therapeutic forms. These are two sides. We, we, we do the same thing. We, we take, okay, what's usable out of cognitive therapy, and we'll go into that in our next video. We'll go into these specific therapies. We take what's usable out of it, and then we use that in order to change ourselves so that we can take what's usable out of ourselves and elevate it. So the re evangelization and the enculturation of the gospel, the elevation of cultural forms and ideologies is one wing of the bird, so to speak. And the other side is the moderation and integration of ourselves. And these things work together to help us transform ourselves and societies into the family of God and to be, and that we become and this is the beautiful thing, that God's love is fatherly love and mercy. So this is the nature of mercy. There's something redeemable. There's something fatherly. There's something that, that needs to change, but it is loved and taken up into something greater. Fatherly love says, okay, I love you and you need to grow up. You know, and so this is the thing that needs to happen into both to our the forms that we will use in order to help ourselves grow and that will be used like that in the relationship interiorly as we elevate the lower things in ourselves. So if I'm angry, I need to call out to God and, and use that, just like David in the Psalms. Just like this is so important to think about it this way, that David in the Psalms, he cries out to God. He says, God, like I'm, I'm, I'm suffering. This is happening. That's happening. All these different things are going on in my life. And then he says, but you're great, God. You know, I love you and you're wonderful. And thank you that you're going to deliver me. He's taking his unconscious, the suffering, you through the conscious, realize who God is, and then kind of speaks that back to the unconscious. So it's like this this union of the of, of through, through the conscious of the unconscious and the superconscious. And so these are ways of speaking about these processes of, of growth and transformation, ways of making simple the things that we are trying to do and achieve in human growth. And so this is the overarching uh, ideas. And so what we need to understand is, is the, some of these principles so that we can begin to kind of have a general conception of what this means for our human growth. So we know 
how as practitioners and consumers, how we can use the disciplines of therapy, psychiatry, psychology in light of our Catholic faith, in light of the incarnate word, so that we may become other incarnations of the word through his grace and mercy.